Jamie, are you ready? Ready. We will call the meeting to order for October 11th. May I have a roll call, please? Stephanie's outside. Oh. I will pause for a moment. Oh, <laughs> we locked Stephanie out? That's terrible. The door was unlocked. Let the record show. The door was I'm sorry, Stephanie. <laughs> Well, hello. Now, you may take a roll call. <laughs> Councilmember Harlan. Here. Councilmember Bertrand. Here. Councilmember Peterson. Here. Oh, what a hectic night. <laughs> Councilmember Bator. Here. And Mayor Termini. Here. Would you all rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. Okay, we have some great presentations here, and the, the first one I'd like to do is the proclamation honoring St. John's Helpful Shop. Are there any folks in the audience from that organization? Come on up. It's going to be long. I need the candy. Oh, you're going to read these. Good. Give a little report. Hmm? Give a little report. Yeah, no, 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 that's good. John, well, we have a City of Capitola Mayor's Proclamation honoring St. John's Helpful Shop, whereas the Episcopal Church of St. John operated the St. John's Helpful Shop in Capitola Village for 65 years, and whereas the shop opened in 1953 to raise money for a new church carpet, but over the years became the source of tens of thousands of dollars given annually to local nonprofits. And whereas the shop resold gently used items in good condition, donated by parishioners and community members, helping the environment through reuse while also supporting the community. And whereas the shop was forced to leave its spot at the corner of Capitola and Monterey Avenue when the building that housed it was sold. Now I therefore, I, Michael Termini, Mayor of Capitola, on behalf of the entire City Council, to hereby honor and thank the many volunteers that made the St. John's Helpful Shop a local landmark in Capitola for over six decades. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I'm Tracy Wells Miller. I'm the priest at St. John's. I've only been there about a year and a half, so I can't take credit for all of this history, but these ladies can. So another round of applause for them. <laughs> And I want to let you all know that we do have a location for reopening now. Um, we're hoping before Christmas, sometime late November, early December. We don't have a specific date yet, but we'll get that out soon. We're going to reopen in Aptos uh, at 246 Center Avenue, which is, if you know where Manuel's is, it's right across the street from there. And it's right around the corner from our church. This original location was right around the corner from the church when it was located here in Depot Hill. So we're sort of continuing that tradition now by having the, the shop right around the corner from the church. So we hope you all will come see us and our loyal customer base will follow us to Aptos. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you ladies. Thank you. Okay, I want to bring a, uh, a gang of uh, junior guards up here. Ava Burke, come on up. Yeah. Sky Davies, come on up. Sky? Not here? Okay. How about Maddie Taylor? <laughs> Madeline Price? Jake Griselli? <laughs> this is Jake's brother, right? Wow, okay. Line up, line up. That's on behalf of Jake tonight. Ellie, Ellie Griselli. Yeah. 
and Raylene Allen. Okay, before I give these all out, these are mayor's proclamations to each of these folks for uh, the 2018 USLA National Lifeguard Championships that we attended. And this is the first year I think we've done this, and we have been remiss, and it's my apologies, because there are hundreds of athletes that have gone before these young athletes that have also earned this distinction. And I hope that the council in the future, yeah, you can applaud, yeah. <laughs> If, if I could have unearthed all the names easily, believe me, I'd have a stack of proclamations this high. I hope this starts a tradition of every year at the end of the season, the guards that go to nationals get these proclamations because I'd say that possibly second to our police force, the junior guards are one of the most important institutions in this city. And that's the truth. And I'm sorry, they're, they're just above the city council, okay? Sorry about that. So, Raylene. Thank Ellie. Thank you. Jake, stand in. Maddie Taylor. Ava. Ava, you won your event, didn't you? This. Sky is not here. Who wants to carry Sky's proclamation? And one of my favorites, Madeline Price. Are you Brian's daughter? I, I, let me embarrass you. You have two of the most amazing, powerful parents, and I've known, I have known your dad since he was as big as you. <laughs> All right. So, everything that parenting should be, you've got. Nicely, nice job rolling the dice and getting in there. Right there. <laughs> okay, you, do you want to say something? You can. Thank you so much for all of your support. It's amazing, and I've been in this program since I was five, and they all have too, and we just cannot thank you enough for the past almost 40 years. So, thank you. <laughs> and, you know, something that, something that everyone might not know, and that is what you're looking at here, potentially in another 10 or 15 years, they will be coordinators on the beach being guards for new junior guards. It is a never-ending cycle. It's amazing how many of our existing guard coordinators started out just like this. So this is truly a remarkable program. Thank you all. Uh, Stephanie, who um, predates me here, has something to say about the Helpful Shop. Well, I just wanted to tell, remind everyone and tell everyone that this was the longest running business in capital of all time. All time. There were some businesses that started way back when, but they're not, they're not in business anymore. There have been many businesses started after this that have been there for a long time also. But this is the business that was in Capitola for the longest time in our history. So we'll put you in the museum and we'll have a special exhibit for you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to uh, give a, a one-minute recess unless all these young junior guards want to sit around for the next hour and watch government at work. That was just a joke. Feel free to leave the room if you'd like to go now. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. It's just easy. And then both these problems are just to go to the socks. Maybe we could just cut. We could do away with almost anything. 
except for junior cars. <laughs> Okay, so much for the feel good portion of tonight's meeting. Let's move on to report on closed session. Thank you, Mayor Termini. The council had one item for uh, discussion on closed session this evening, and that's the ongoing uh, negotiations between the city and the Capitola Police Officers Association. The council received a, a status report from the city manager uh, concerning those negotiations, and the council gave instructions to the city manager uh, for the continuation of those negotiations. Otherwise, the council took no reportable action in closed session. Thank you. Are there any additional materials for tonight's agenda? Yes, we received quite a few um, public comments for item 2A, which we just had. We received one. For item 10A, there were five. For item 10B, there was one. And for item 10C, there were two, including one that was received late this afternoon that is on the dais. Um, all of the additional materials are also available at the back of the room. Very good. Uh, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Staff has no changes. We'll go on to public comments. This is a time where you can address the council on items not on tonight's agenda. Anyone who would like to speak to us for items not on the agenda tonight, step right up. Mayor Termini, council members and city staff. My name is Linda Smith and I am here um, tonight to sort of follow up on a letter that I sent early in July, commending Sergeant Sarah Ryan for her commitment to the community, her professionalism, her dedication to a high standard of service and exemplary performance as a Capitola police officer. Tonight, I come before you to more publicly recognize Sarah, as well as the entire Capitola PD, but also to remind the community of the benefits of reaching out to our officers and partnering with them. As I detailed in my letter, Sarah was instrumental in helping the community resolve a recent complicated, disruptive, and dangerous situation in the Jewel Box neighborhood that started in May of this year. During two informal community meetings, she provided leadership for a positive and productive discussion of the issues, the legal implications, and the potential outcomes, and she educated residents on departmental policy with regards to the situation. She engaged residents and county agency and court officials in a cooperative and progressive partnership. The situation reached, in my opinion, the best possible outcome on October the 1st. This would not have happened without Sarah's efforts. But I'm here tonight not, not only to recognize her in a more public way, but the larger police department and, and its leadership as well. Several of our Capitola officers, including Sarah, have been here since the beginning of my tenure in Capitola. We've had multiple police chiefs, multiple city councils, and our officers have always been quality. Under the leadership that sits before me now in the council, the city manager, and our current police chief, Terry McManus, I believe that we have an exceptional police department. I was privileged to experience a ride along with one of our officers as part of a city academy that I attended. He has since been promoted and remains an asset to Capitola. We had a potential home invasion at our home on Prospect. I wasn't home when the alarm went off, so the officers were on site when I arrived only a few minutes later. Sarah was one of those officers who kept me safe while they secured my home. That was my first encounter with police officers other than a couple of speeding tickets. And it sort of set a standard. I witnessed a, an arrest that required forceful restraint of an uncooperative individual who had put the community at risk. The officers that were involved in that were exemplary. I saw bystanders disre disrespect and heckle officers as they dealt with a known gang member during a traffic stop that involved a search. Their training was evidence as they remained focused and unreactive to the insults while keeping everyone safe. These encounters happened over many years, but in all cases, our officers handled the situations well. Hiring quality officers, keeping quality experienced officers, and maintaining departmental policies and leadership that set the standard high are what distinguish Capitola apart from other departments. We have a long-standing track record for doing those things here in Capitola. 
I wanted to share my experience with the community and remind everyone that you can work with our police officers. We're privileged to live in a community where it's not us against them, no matter what your gender, your ethnic, ethnicity, nor your income level. During this time of distress, distrust and division in our country, I am proud to say that we have the leadership and the quality officers to partner with. For the community, don't be afraid to reach out to them. To our officers, I want to say thank you for what you do every day. Don't underestimate the benefits of reaching out to the community. Together, we can solve issues. And to you, Capitola's leadership, I want to say thank you. Thank you for making our police department a priority and for keeping Capitola a safe and quality community to live in. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi. My name is Gene Bernal. I'm 406 Grand. I uh, got a notice of tonight's meeting yesterday and I had to rearrange a whole bunch of things. I realize that sometimes agendizing items get done at the last minute, but I'd appreciate it if any item that affected, especially people like me who, this is a second home and we have to travel a distance, I'm sure there were others, we'd get a little bit more notification. That's thank it. you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address the council on items not on this evening's agenda? Then we'll go on to city council, city treasurer, and staff comments. Staff, do you have any comments? I don't think I have any comments at this time. Very good. Mr. Treasurer. Uh, thank you, Mayor Termini. I'd like to uh, point out that we have a, a financial advisory committee meeting that's going to be scheduled uh, uh, October 23rd. And I want to point it out because it's got two interesting items on it that you might and the public might want to attend. First is uh, there is uh, a surplus, not a surplus, but the library trust fund, as you know, Measure S, I guess, is money's come in. And uh, our finance director, Jim Malberg, has um, some ideas. Since that money isn't going to be spent all at once, and there's probably about $4 million that he can come up with that we won't have need to, to actually utilize for about 18 months, he wants to present the, to the FAC some uh, creative ways, uh, maybe not, not Vegas, but some creative ways to uh, invest that money and maybe get a little, little interest on that income. The second item uh, that we're going to discuss is the notion of increased powers of the Financial Advisory Committee uh, in the anticipation of the possible passage, passage of Measure K. Uh, we may want to rethink and formalize the uh, Financial Advisory Committee's role. So we're going to discuss both those items. I think they're both of interest. Thank you. Thank you. Council? No comments. Kristen? Yeah, just briefly, uh, the Capitola Foundation had their charity annual charity golf tournament last Friday. Uh, it was a wonderful event, and I want to thank everyone who participated and volunteered. Um, really, the, the volunteers make that event happen, and it was wonderful, as it is every year. Very true. Thank you. Jock? Yeah. Um, so I want to thank Linda Smith for coming up. And also want to mention that uh, several times I get comments from the public about things that they're very happy about. and staff has solved a problem or come to their aid or done something else that basically was very important for them. And recently I did get one and I passed it on to uh, the manager in charge and I think he was very happy to receive that. So anytime something happens and people in the public are happy about it, it's just like any of us, we want to know when we did a good job. So thank you. Stephanie. wanted to give a <clears throat> quick report on the annual League of California Cities conference that I went to in Long Beach from September 12th through 14th. It was very, very interesting. They had a lot of very, very interesting topics and as always they're open to new topics if any council members or cities have any requests for any topics. So I went to one that um, was the benefits of diversity and municipal management. It can happen to you, harassment claims against city officials, which was very, very interesting. Hadn't, hadn't thought about that. <clears throat> Coastal cities had a meetup and they had a group talk about some of the issues that are before us. Coastal development, erosion, growth, water, all sorts of things. Um, how to overcome obstacles to pass your sales tax measure. Uh, they had a lot of sessions for the city attorneys. Um, strategies to manage increasing pension costs and 
uh, unconscious bias, which I also want to talk about for just just a minute. And the um, the diversity um, issue was very very interesting. It was the benefits of diversity in municipal management. And it says, when it comes to your city management staff, do they look, think, and speak like the residents you serve? Having a truly diverse city staff can speak like the can lead to some enormous benefits such as creative problem solving and the growth of a flexible, collaborative, and inclusive work environment. The more your community can identify with your staff, the better your public engagement can be. In this session, our panelists will share why <clears throat> they value diversity in their staff and how to grow a diverse workplace. <clears throat> so the speakers were <clears throat> Paul Arevalo from City Manager of West Hollywood, Lori, <coughs> Lori Sassoon from Rancho Cucamonga, and City Manager of Stockton. <clears throat> and their basic premise was that if we are inclusive to everyone, if we look like the community, we can increase our talent pool. <clears throat> and um, uh, only 20% of the city managers in California are women. So they said, how can we get more women? involved in leadership positions and in some of the positions that traditionally are male dominated how can we get more women in wastewater the whole wastewater industry and working in a municipal wastewater facility why not and um, talked about strong mentoring and coaching and things like that so <clears throat> I'll give you more of an update next meeting but that was very it was very interesting very good um, I don't think we've had a meeting since the Beach Festival. It was a great success. A lot of locals. The fun run was good. Um, and the lighted float parade was uh -huh. beyond our expectations with uh, no casualties. So we liked that. And it was, it was very exciting. And it was low key. And it's exactly what we were looking for, which was a replacement for the Begonia Festival that didn't drive us all crazy on Labor Day. Um, I would like to thank the Monty Foundation. The fireworks were brilliant, amazing. Um, they are so generous, and their efforts are helping to fund the Children's Wing at the New Capitola Library. The Monty Foundation always comes through and always supports our city, and I appreciate it. Uh, I want to thank the Capitola Police Department for both those events, the Beach Festival and the fireworks. You kept streets closed. You kept folks safe. We had no, I don't believe, uh, incidents or issues in any of those events, which is always nice to say. And I want to shout out to Capitola Public Works, where if you didn't realize it before, the Begonia Festival and the New Beach Festival would never take place without Public Works. That is the truth. And I saw it for the first time up close and personal. You have an amazing crew, Steve. Just remarkable. Um, that, so let me just, before we go into the, um, the rest of the agenda here, let me just note a little bit of housekeeping for tonight. We're using our card system throughout the night, which means green cards are one minute, <coughs> yellow cards are two minutes, red cards are three minutes of speaking. We will take all the green cards first, but you'll be restricted to one minute. We'll move on to the yellows, then the reds. If you want to speak, get one of those cards and fill it out now. It will save a lot of time up at the podium. So um, we will now go on to our consent agenda. Yep. Item Oh, I'm sorry. We missed our museum board. Um, please, Madam City Clerk, museum board appointment. Yes. Um, <coughs> earlier this year, the council um, added to the options for membership in a number of our advisory bodies, including the Historical Museum Board, to allow youth membership. And we have a youth applicant. Um, he met with the Museum Board, just as any applicant does, ahead of um, a recommendation. Uh, they were very impressed with him. His name is Joshua Henshaw. He is a student from New Brighton Middle School. And the Board of Trustees of the museum is recommending that the City Council appoint him as a youth member to join them. Is Joshua here tonight? Why don't you step up to the podium, Joshua? We'll break you in. We'll break you in well. Yes, you can, Dave. Well, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce Joshua. Uh, we were indeed impressed, and and again, I'm I'm Dave Payton, and a member of the uh, museum board, along with uh, Pam Greninger here as well tonight. But uh, we were we were really jazzed. We got a chance to meet him. Um, 
He has an interest in history, certainly. He's 15 years old, um, got a lot of interest, no doubt. Uh, we're just as interested in getting feedback from him, uh, getting his input, and finding out about what we can do to attract young people to the museum. So it's a, it's a, a nice fit for us. But before I I'll let him say a word or two, I want to also say a, a good thank you to his mother, because this is an opportunity where the parent has to, to be with the child. Child, sorry, with the young man. The, 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 the minor, the minor. Minor, yes, yes. thank you. And so a, a thanks to her as well, because it takes two of them to, to do this. But uh, we're delighted. I don't know if any of the other commissions have yet uh, gotten a, um, a student, but uh, we're delighted with Josh. Did you want to say a? Welcome, Josh. Thanks. Even. Well, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Very good. But stay right there. Um, there's been a recommendation. Is there a motion to approve this? Motion to approve recommendation. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Okay. And Josh, if you stay to the rest of the meeting, you'll recognize that a unanimous decision is not always the way it goes. So we'll move on to the consent calendar, actions taken as a single vote. We have regular council meeting minutes, an annual donations report. Is there a motion to approve consent, or does anyone like to pull an item? I'd just like to remark how the city is quite privileged to have so many donations. It's um, People like, very like impressive. Yeah. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. So moved. No. Jock, you're second? I'm second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? We'll move on to general government public hearings, and we'll have a report from Public Works on the jewel box traffic calming options. Welcome, Steve. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Item before you is a further report on uh, jewel box traffic calming options we've been working on for the past couple of years. Um, well, quick, I just wanted to give you an overview of kind of a big big picture of what, what the issues are here. So we're all familiar with the map. This is the kind of the formal jewel box, and this yellow line identifies what we've called the greater jewel box area. And these red lines you see coming in are major arterials coming from the west to the east that all lead into uh, the jewel box neighborhood, the greater jewel box neighborhood. And for the most part, we have... Romer Street, which turns into Jade Street, Capitol Road, and then this is Portola with an access point along 47th Avenue. All these major, I don't want to use the word commute routes, but heavily used routes in the evening all end up going through the Greater Jewelbox neighborhood, which is primarily residential neighborhood, residential streets. Um, where they're going to is, is kind of a combination. Some people are trying to go out Wharf Road to go to uh, SoCal Drive. And then we have you know, groups of people trying to go through the village across Stockton Avenue Bridge. So that's big picture, what, what the problem is and what we're trying to, to resolve. So on June 27th of this year, we held a workshop at Jade Street Community Center um, to kind of flush out some ideas with the members of the public and get their input. It was attended by approximately 50 residents. Um, in that workshop, we reviewed kind of the existing conditions, which I just showed you. We included pictures of what traffic calming measures there are in place, and we also reviewed survey results from a survey we did approximately a year ago, kind of on the same subject matter. Um, we presented Traffic calming options um, that follow the, the three E's you hear with traffic calming, education, engineering, and enforcement. Uh, again, we presented uh, options and examples of those uh, traffic calming uh, methods that we, we could implement. And then we, we did some uh, straw polling and took some comments and uh, recorded those. So from the polling results, we identified in, in the workshop some short-term options, which means they're probably something we could implement relatively quickly, wouldn't involve a lot of permitting. Costs are, are sometimes a little higher than other costs, but uh, um, this was the results of that. So the education effort, and that's where you, you hand out pamphlets, you try and go door to door and talk to people, and um, that didn't get a lot of support, I think, um, because of the nature of the uh, problems here. A lot of people are out of town, or live outside the neighborhood, or are using the area. Um, so anyway, that got zero percent support. That's pretty strong. <laughs> um, 
enforcement got 60% support, and that's to be uh, understandable. Everybody like a policeman at their corner at all times um, enforcing it. Obviously, that can't be done. I think the police department does an excellent job in trying to move around uh, where they do traffic enforcement, but certainly increased traffic enforcement is something that uh, everybody would like, and including those in the greater Jewel Box neighborhood. Next, we talked about neighborhood signage. I have examples of these coming up in a minute, um, especially this one. That's where you, you make sure people realize that they're traveling through a residential neighborhood. They're no longer on an arterial street. We did, we've done this type of signage in the Riverview neighborhood and had some success. Uh, it's all qualitative uh, experiences. We didn't have any traffic data to compare, but um, so neighborhood signage received a 60% support. We talked about additional speed bumps or speed humps. Those are the kind that you see on 45th, 47th, and 49th Avenue. They are designed to slow people down below 25 miles an hour, and those had 40% support. We also talked about speed tables, and speed tables are uh, same as speed humps, except they're flat across the top and kind of spread out, and they're often used in conjunction with uh, crosswalks. So it gives you an opportunity to slow people down at a crosswalk. Um, particularly on, on Jade Street, you'll, we'll see in a minute, um, those were uh, received 90% 90, 90 support to do that. Studies have shown that speed tables and speed bumps probably deflect upwards of 20% of the traffic. People decide they don't want to go the speed bumps and they'll go seek another way. Obviously that's traffic studies. We don't have any data to actually see what it may do here, but that's what they show. Last thing we talked about was bulb outs. That's narrowing entrances and exits from uh, at intersections so people have to slow down more. Uh, you typically slow it down to about a lane and a half so that there's yielding that goes on in there. Those only receive 25%. We then looked at some midterm options. These ones probably take a little longer to implement or as far as studies or, or costs or um, impacts. Um, turn restrictions, and what we're talking about here is, is restricting certain turn movements during the commute hour. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. And then we also talked about one-way streets. Certainly that's something we looked at um, in great length in previous work on this project and uh, only received 25% support at the at the workshop. Then there were some long-term options. Um, these are either expensive or require a significant amount of studies and, and impact reports that would need to be done. So that was road closures, full, full or half closures, both within the jewel box itself or uh, the streets coming in. Signalizing intersections, uh, one of the, you know, the reason people are going through residential streets is the arterials are, aren't working. One way to improve arterial flow is to take out four-way stop signs and put in traffic signals. And then the road closure on Jade Street Park, which is something uh, the council specifically asked us to uh, look at. Um, you can see the turn restrictions, going back to the term, received an 80% support. The one-way streets, a 25% support. The road closures and the signalized intersections only re received a 10% response, uh, 10 support, and the road closure on Jade Street did receive 60% support. So looking at the recommendations that we're making tonight, the first would be to institute some neighborhood signage. And I'll give an example of the signage here. It just warns people that they're driving through a, a residential area, asks them to slow down. Um, it's hard to measure the effectiveness of these. Um, you know, I don't think they're, they're, they're not a panacea. They're not going to solve the problems by themselves, but they're something in the toolbox that helps people uh, recognize where, where they're driving and they're no longer on a freeway or an arterial. The map over here shows arrows where they could be installed. This is all the entrances into different neighborhoods. I think initially, I would, if we move forward, we would focus on here, which is where Jay comes up and people go down 45th and they're entering the jewel box and probably the one down here on 47th Avenue at Portola. The other idea is to install um, the speed tables that I talked about. Here's a picture of a, a speed table. Speed tables can either be made of rubber, um, something that's pre-made pre and sent to the site, um, or it can be built out of asphalt. The actual price is about the same for each one. They're you know, anywhere from fifteen to $20,000 a piece to install. 
Uh, one advantage of, of maybe using a rubber one is it could be removed more easily um, or moved if it, we didn't quite get the location right. I do think the asphalt ones are probably more durable if they're going to be there for the long term. The map shows the proposed locations. We haven't you know, nailed it down to the exact foot of where it's going, but we've proposed two along Jade Street. Since we want to include crosswalks in these, I'd try to incorporate a good place for the um, Trade Winds Mobile Home Park here to be able to cross uh, and get across the street there, and then one near uh, uh, Ruby Court. And to prevent people from coming here and say, oh, I don't want to drive down the street and come here at 42nd Avenue, which again, back to Capitol Road, we recommend one on 42nd Avenue too. Looking at the, the midterm options, uh, the commute turn restrictions, um, the first, the locations that make the most sense would be on uh, 47th Avenue where people come here um, on Portola wanting to go east through the village and this, as we all know, backs up and certainly can back up to this point. And cars are turning left in onto 47th Avenue going through this residential neighborhood trying to find a way out that's uh, less impacted. Um, the other one is the primary route is coming down Jade Street, turning left onto 45th and immediately right. It's more of a dog leg onto Topaz. So if we were to restrict these turning movements um, from 4 to 6 p.m., no left turn here or no right turn here uh, would be the start. I will say that the, these type of uh, traffic calming measures are, are really uh, largely dependent on enforcement actions by the police department. Um, I think if we put them up, uh, even without enforcement, we'll have some compliance to begin with as if uh, we don't have sufficient uh, enforcement over time, people will realize that the signs don't mean a whole lot and we'll probably return to the state we're in now. So that's one thing to consider with these. The long-term options um, we talked about really is signalizing the intersections on Capitol Road at 49th and 45th. Um, that would help the level of service of those. Obviously, if we really want to solve the problem, we're going to have to look at the whole commute route through Capitol, which involves Stockton at Esplanade, Stockton at Wharf, Stockton and Cap Ave. And I don't think that's anything that anybody wants to do is encourage more commuting through Capitola. But it would um, you know, help alleviate the, the congestion we see along Capitola Road, which is forcing people into the neighborhood. And then the road closures along Jade Street, um, we talked about <coughs> potentially closing the eastbound uh, direction of Jade Street at 41st Avenue. Certainly something that the, you know, as I said, 60% approval at the, at the workshop. It has big impacts. Um, it obviously changes the level of services at other intersections. Capitol Road and 41st would be impacted. Uh, Portola and 41st going into the county be impacted. The, uh, Kim Lee Horn, the consultant assisting in the city with this project, did look at the traffic studies and made some preliminary estimates and it looks like at least the intersections that I've just mentioned would be go from a level of service uh, C or D to E. So that would again mitigate, would need to be mitigated as we go through it and that's where we get to the signalized intersections at that point. So they all kind of would end up tying together. Obviously it was very expensive and very long-term projects that we would need to work on. So quick uh, advertisement for traffic counts, if I may. Um, the, the studies we've done to date are, are based on a snapshot of 2017 traffic count, counts we took along Topaz, Opal, and Jewel. We've incorporated other data we've got collected along the way from other projects, such as the general plan update that has traffic intersection counts from 2013 in it. So it's, it's a lot of older data. And if, we were, if we're interested in measuring the effectiveness and coming down with hard answers on how much traffic do we have, how much do we, can we move around, uh, we'll need to do additional studies. Um, and the cost for that is probably ten to $50,000, depending on, on what kind of information we really want to get at. <coughs> Finally, costs and budget. So neighborhood signs and speed tables. Um, I'm estimating at $50,000, that's for three speed tables and, and some amount of signage. Um, turn restriction signs, probably ten to $20,000, relatively inexpensive on the, on the capital end. Again, there are potential service level impacts with the police department. And then the traffic signals and road closures, you know, I 
easily could spend eight hundred thousand dollars trying to move those projects forward so at this time no funds have been budgeted for this project so if we do get direction to move forward um, our recommendation well I'll get straight to that is to develop is direct staff to develop plans for increased neighborhood signage and speed tables installation on Jaden 42nd Avenue we would bring those formal plans back to you and then for approval and then identify budget resources at that time that's my report council questions of public works Ed Kristen no. Go ahead. Yeah. so um, you're talking about level of service and potentially doing studies with the um, what is the impact of the uh, crossings like the tables the signage uh, I get the sense that it's not going to trigger a study at all you consider no, that pretty low excuse me uh, yes uh, the, the the speed tables and things like that wouldn't impact the level of service it doesn't wouldn't redirect a, a large volume of traffic from one intersection to another so I think those would would have negligible impacts and not something we'd have to study okay thanks Stephanie just a, uh, just a clarification on page three of the staff report talking about installing speed tables on Jade Street he said some negative at the last sentence of the first paragraph some negative aspects of speed tables include increased traffic noise near the hump and increased emergency response times which should be decreased I believe increased yes mm -hmm. you're correct thank you oh. It's going to it's going to decrease the emergency response time. Yeah. Any impediment? Yeah, it's increased. It's better in speed bumps, and we have talked to the police, the fire department when we we're looking at initial studies, and they would support um, speed bumps at that point. I think your language is correct. Is that good, Stephanie? Oh, increased response times. I uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, so the response times would increase in length. So that actually is a correct statement. If you put in a speed table, the response time increases? Yes. Slows down the fire Slows truck. down the vehicle, takes them longer to respond. That's an increase in response time. It takes slightly longer for a fire truck oh, to I get see. to where it needs to go. It's like a double negative. Yeah. OK. A, a couple seconds. Yeah. yeah speed, speed tables are, are go over. You can go over at much higher speed than you can on a speed bump. Do we have any speed tables around here? The only one I know about is at uh, Mineta Inter International Airport. Yeah, those are giant ones. Yeah, um, I, th I do believe they're in San there's some in Santa Cruz. Um, I'm not sure where the, where the I know I've driven over them there before, on, but on I can't the west side there. Yeah, on the west, on the west side, side exactly. Yeah. Good. Um, we will now open this up to the public, and I, I've received several emails that people were asking us not to put barricades up. Let's be clear. <laughs> Barricades are off the table, so we don't need to talk about that. So please line up. Let's see the green cards. Who are you? Anyone? There's a green card lady. Um, I just want to say thank you for having the, the, the taking the time to do the workshops. I know that a lot of people attended. I did not, but it was a good opportunity for the neighborhood to come out and really talk about it. And so really appreciate that. Great. Any other green cards? No? You got to pick a color card. Good. I trust you. <laughs> Good evening, City Council. I just want to thank all of you and Steve for stepping back, asking the neighborhood to get involved. I was delighted at how cordial and problem solving the neighborhood was when presented with opportunities versus costs. And I think you've got some good. Uh, directions to give to staff once you find the money great thank you thanks Rose green cards anyone don't worry about it Brett you are, Rose. <laughs> I just want to fully support the staff's recommendation and once again great job going through and and bringing in the full neighborhood on this thank you thank you I suspect you two fellows have red cards Okay, you're gonna. It's gonna take you a while, so you may as well have a seat. Um, are there any yellow cards out there? There we go. Welcome. Hey, good evening. My name is Bill Gray, 1440 Prospect, and uh, I would like to thank the council and uh, Mr. Jesberg for the analysis and the recommendations. I think we're about where we need to be. It's been a long time getting here. Uh, 
But I think the least invasive approach and the most neighborly approach is uh, where we should uh, should be on this one. So I encourage you to move forward. And uh, my only reservation is the relative lack of mention of enforcement as it relates to the neighborhood signage. Mm. And I would say parenthetically that uh, my home was burglarized two years ago on Prospect Avenue. And outside of neighborhood resource officers, I have seen two police vehicles go by my home in the last two years. So I think uh, increased enforcement in the jewel box would be appropriate, and I believe we look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other yellow cards? There we go. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. And uh, I would also like to thank the council for taking the time to deal with this issue. I know it's been a long slog, and uh, we're very appreciative of that. Um, that being said, the, we have talked about this at length in, on Topaz Street. I'm Jim Hobbs. I live at 4590 Topaz. And um, while we are appreciative of the direction of this, we really would like to see the signs redirecting at the end of Jade Street and redirecting at, at 45th and Portola. Um, the, the community signs that say this is a community really are there's no way of enforcing that and and I know Alan is going to elaborate on this much more eloquently than I will but I would just like to put in my two cents worth and also to say that uh, in the Kimley Horn uh, report here they say that there's a 50 percent violation rate if you just put up the signs and you don't enforce them and they almost say that like it's a bad thing but um, from where I'm sitting on Topaz Street where we had a, a count of 1,200 cars a day. Well, if that drops to 600, I'd count that as a major improvement. And if there were enforcement and you were handing out, I don't know, $200 a ticket signs to 600 people, that's 12,000 bucks right off the bat. So, you know, it looks like the signs would be pretty easy to pay for since that's the least expensive and also the least intrusive way of going about this. I'm also very supportive of the speed tables. Um, I think that will do a lot to help the people out there on Jade Street and crosswalks are definitely needed out there. It's a, you know, you can take your life into your hands trying to get across to the, uh, to the Civic Center and the playground and all of that that's down there. So um, Thank you very much, and that's my two cents. Thank you. And for the record, um, we, the city does not make any money on moving violations. So the $200 ticket sounds like cash cow. We're not making any money on that. <laughs> yes, please step up. Hi, my name is Cindy Cuss. I've uh, been a homeowner on Topaz Street for 38 years and have been attending the workshops, community workshops, traffic commission meetings, city council meetings related to the traffic calming measures. Um, this is my first time speaking and I wanna thank you all for uh, the work that you have done, especially Steve. And uh, I pretty much am gonna reiterate what Jim just said, I too feel I'm very supportive of the traffic tables on Jade Street. Um, having the community workshops have extended this whole thing beyond our original Topaz issue. And I think that the possible 20% of people who will not be using that will have a direct effect on us. But I'd also like to suggest that the no turn signs um, be put in place as a short term measure rather than a midterm measure because I think that we will actually see some effect on Topaz. And one of the things that was brought up yesterday at the Traffic Commission is that if there are time restrictions on those streets, Waze, which is the app that directs people to shortcut will 
that will be known to people who are commuting, that they cannot make those turns at that time. So I think that's important. And I also agree that the short-term option of putting in neighborhood signs is probably going to be a waste of money and ineffective, so I do not support that option. Thank you. Thank you. Any other yellow cards? Seeing none, let's uh, line up the red cards. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Alan Cable. I, I'm a Topaz resident. Um, I'm pretty much going to reiterate what, what has been said, but let me go through this. Um, first of all, the, uh, the meeting was great. Uh, it was really positive. No bad words were spoken. Everyone was very enthusiastic, and we got a lot of good feedback. So thanks to Steve for that. Um, I think um, at the Topaz residents, I think I can speak for them, and that we all agree that the speed tables, Jade has a problem. We know that. We, we know that the speed tables uh, will help to, to fix the speed on Jade and on 42nd, and we're very supportive of that. Um, the neighborhood signs, on the other hand, we feel are pretty much a waste of money. Uh, the report is very clear that there is really no evidence that neighborhood signs work. And in fact, there is already a neighborhood sign at the end of Jade at 41st that says neighborhood reduce speed, and uh, you can see how effective it is. That's why we're putting speed tables in. Um, and I think the worthy leader of our, of our um, traffic commission uh, basically stated yesterday that she has neighborhood signs on, on her area and they're totally ineffective. So it's a lot of money for what we think is an ineffective approach. Um, on the other hand, the no turn, no entry signs, um, the one especially between the junction of Portola eastbound and 45th, uh, the one at the junction of Jade and Topaz, we think would be very effective. And we do think they would need enforcement, um, uh, but they are enforceable, whereas the neighborhood signs from our perspective uh, seem to be virtually unenforceable. We don't exactly know how our worthy policemen are going to figure out how someone is a neighborhood person or not. It's a really difficult problem to give them, whereas a no turn, no entry is very enforceable, and we think that a few tickets are probably going to be enough to disincentivize uh, the people that, that make the commute. So in summary, we would really propose that we save our money, you know, neighborhood signs, put them up if you want to, but we already have a lot of signs around, and the place gets really cluttered up with signs. If they're not going to be effective, and we know that, wait, save our money. Put the, t put the no turn signs in, you can do it for about a tenth the cost or a fifth the cost of the neighborhood signs, and then let's see how it works out. We said this, we would do this as a trial. Let's do it as a trial. If we need to add more turns or more no turn signs on the other jewel box streets, let's do that. There was 80% approval for that in the meeting. Let's take the, let's take the opportunity, step forward and do it now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Good evening, Council. My name's Todd Anderson. I live on Jewel Street. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess what I want to say is uh, I'm against having uh, the traffic be sent away from Topaz into the other, onto the other streets or in, in that direction, let me say. And just for a quick note, today, I mean, to me, this thing goes back when the speed bumps were put on the 47th. So we're just kind of chasing this thing as it goes. So on those speed bumps going down 47th, I counted, this is just something, 19 houses on, uh, I live on Jewel. So between 45th and 47th, 19 homes facing Jewel. Uh, back on 47th, 13 houses in six blocks facing 47th. So to me, that doesn't seem very representative. I know I'm going back, but of the community, that's 19 people, 19 homes against, 13 homes against 19 on one block. So I guess what I'm saying, I don't want this to be where it's like a small interest group is going to override what other people want. The guy on Garnet and uh, 47th pushed through those speed bumps way back when. And I don't have any actual data, but I know from that now cars go down Jewel. They're just trying to get through. So that has changed the pattern in the Jewel box from that. So I, I don't think we need any more uh, 
you know, let's not go down this road of this and that, like the guy before me just said that, you know, let's do this on Topaz and then we can add the other streets. No, baloney. You know, let's just, uh, let's not have a small group, you know, tell the whole jewel box what's going to happen. That's my input. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else with a red card? There we go. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Marcos Vascovi. I live on Topaz. And first, I'd like to thank Steve so much. The workshop went really well. I mean, it was really great to be with the whole community and with have, having like everyone trying to collaborate. And that was fantastic. And, and so um, I don't know, uh, you know. So the I think just want to reiterate what Alan was talking about. I think that um, the workshop was pretty conclusive. I think we all, you know, the, I think the, what we're asking here is just what was midterm, why midterm, right? That's what we're asking. We, sh we, we should do that right, right away. And that was like 80% approval, and 80% approval by everybody who was there in workshop collaborating, right? So now there's not like a small group of people trying to convince everybody. That was decided by everybody who was there. There was 80% approval. All we're asking is that move that from why midterm? What are we waiting for, right? Someone get, get killed? Right, we want to move it now. That's all we're asking. Uh, we're also concerned that some of you may not, you know, uh, be with the, the council uh, starting next year. So we don't want to start this all over with, you know, a whole new group to to learn about all that stuff. So, uh, so yeah. So we're just asking you guys to, you know, let's do it now. And it's very cheap, right? Instead of like all the signs around, it's just two signs. And if you want to put in every single street, like Jade and all the other streets on the new box, you know, it's just a few more. But, and, and that's do a trial. You know, we're going to be, you know, collecting data. The best thing to do is just a trial to see what's going to happen. If the cars are diverging to the other streets, we put the signs on the other streets too. That's not a big deal. All right? Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, Council. I'm Welcome. Carl Schubert. I live on 4730 Topaz Street. And I've been here and talked to you before. Thank you for hearing me again. Um, we've been at this for two and a half years since the first time I came here and asked you for your help. And we've gone round and round and round, and we've gone through different avenues. Myself and these others have worked with the Traffic and, and Parking Commission. We've been here. I've been in Steve's office multiple times, and God knows how many emails I've sent him. Um, we've been involved in, in the mail survey that went out a year ago. We were also involved in the, the city meeting that was at the Jade Street Center. Um, so two and a half years later, I have to tell you, I'm very frustrated. We, we have not had any action put in place by the council and by the city. And it, and it is frustrating. And, and to kind of follow up with Marcos said, um, there's going to be a changing of the guard. And is this going to extend things? Is this going to require another year or so for people to come on board? I, I hope not. What I'm hoping tonight that you can do for us is, is accept you know, the report that Steve and his group is giving, but take some modifications to it. I'm, I'm wholeheartedly in support of the speed tables on Jade. That's a dangerous situation in another part, not in my neighborhood, but, but a way for that affects other people more directly. And I think that ought to be done. I think that's important. It's going to be expensive, but it's important. It's not going to affect cut through traffic in Jade or down through Topaz very much. Very minimal effect there. But it does need to be done for a safety issue. The neighborhood signs. Yeah, why don't we put up signs that just say, be nice? You know, because it's going to be about as effective. Even, even your, the, the traffic people in their report, they say they're virtually ineffective. There's no data that says they have any effect. What I'd like you to see you do is to accept the report, but direct them to modify it. Direct them to do the no turns at those two intersections. It's an inexpensive one. It's something that can be done on a trial basis. It's something that we can see how it works. And again, it got 80% of the community support. It's, it's not that invasive. It's not that there was this big pushback like the bollards or the diverters had. So that's what I'm asking of you. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi. 
Good Hello. Evening. Thank you. Um, and I want to thank Steve. Not only has he put on some great meetings and um, worked hard on the workshop for all of us, he brought cookies and treats, too. Oh, that's how he does it. All right. Yeah, so those of us who came without dinner got a cookie. Um, I just wanted to tell you that I live on the corner of 47th and Jewel, and the other day when Jacques was down passing out flyers and stuff for the election, I think he even made a comment about the speed with which people travel down 47th Street. And I want you to understand that most of that is rush hour traffic. So I want to encourage you to put up some signs that say no left turns off of Portola. But please consider no right turn on Sundays and different avenues. We have gangs of motorcycles. I mean, 15, 18 of them sometimes in a group come up from the village, up Portola, make a right on 47th, and they use those speed bumps as um, practice humps for wheelies, I guess you'd call them. And it's really frustrating. It's dangerous for pets and people and kids that are out walking. We can't sit in the yard and enjoy it. So it's a safety factor, it's a noise factor, as well as a traffic factor. So I want you to encourage, I want to encourage you to do something a little more drastic than you're proposing, especially since we've been working on this for two and a half years. Thank you. Anyone else? For the record, I drive, I ride a motorcycle and I can't imagine someone intentionally going over a speed bump. It just doesn't translate. I'll go for the drinks, but I'm not riding my bike over those speed bumps. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good, Ron. Hi, I'm Ron Burke. I'm, um, I just like to say, not a, not a resident, but a member of the Jewel Box community. I say that because we are a community as a whole. We need remediation to these issues. I really feel for the folks on Topaz. They've been at this for two and a half years. When I, and I will admit it, I'm the guy, who's, I'm the guy I got the humps in back in 1999. I'm one of seven people letting a community of seven from 45th all the way to Prospect. I think it's been very successful. It was very dangerous before. It's not exactly as safe in some ways now. But the biggest problem that's been noted is that the travelers <clears throat> coming through have the worst attitude and the highest volume during those commute hours eastbound between roughly about 3 p.m. and 6.30 p.m. Those are the ones we're really after. People aren't bad. They aren't because their drive cars aren't bad. We drive cars too. In fact, our neighborhood sometimes I see locals with speed as well. I go, what are you doing? But the issue is we need to resolve this. I think the idea of speed tables on uh, Jade Street, two of those on 42nd, it's a great idea. It's fantastic. But the folks who started this whole thing off again, like I did in 99, are the folks on Topaz Street. And there's nothing in the solution that di directly attacks that issue. The two left, left turn lanes, or the two left turn, no left turns between, say, 3 to 7 p.m., uh, both at 47th and Partala, and 45th and uh, Jade Street, I guess it'd be. Those are probably your biggest bang for the buck. Uh, enforceability is going to be an issue. I drive sometimes in 880. I can tell you in the carpool lane, I'll look in the fast lane behind me and probably half the cars are single occupancy. But when someone gets pulled over, everyone takes notice. And we're a small community. Where the word goes around, one ticket every few days or so, people are going to learn. And you can hide pretty well. So please, be bold. If we don't put our step, our step forward to try something out, we're not going to know. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Would anyone else like to address the council? Seeing none, we'll bring it back, and uh, we'll start with Stephanie. Well, I really appreciate everybody putting in all this time for two and a half years. I think none of us ever thought it would take this long. And so I think hopefully we've all learned from this that maybe when we have a problem like this again, we can have a more simple solution, because it's very frustrating for all of us and for all of you and for staff to have to work on this and continue to work on it and continue to work on it. So I'm, I'm really glad we're getting to the end, I think, of this phase. Not, it's not going to be the end of this project because I think this is going to be an experiment to see how this works. And so I'm happy to support the report, and I think it's very timely. And um, if we had all stopped at the beginning maybe and thought about what would work and just start off with signs and um, some uh, speed hump or something simple, we wouldn't be here today. We'd, we'd, I think maybe we would be happier. but. Anyway, let's, let's all learn from this and try to have a better process next time and really stop before we jump into it and see what would be more successful because I don't like having these kind of processes that, that, are, that take, take so long. Everybody's frustrated about it, but hopefully we'll get some good solution. Stephanie, are you in favor of any particular solution here tonight? I think the signs and the speed l lumps are fine. Got it. The, uh, the no left turn signs and the speed lumps. Me too. 
I would like to start with just this, the signs and the speed lumps first, and then we, we can talk about signs. no list turn later. Oh, you'd like that the, the, it's a neighborhood be nice signs? No, no, the, the um, whichever signs we come up with that we think would help and work. Got it. This is a neighborhood. This is a, you know, some of the neighborhood signs I think I'd like to try first. Shock. So uh, right off, I'd like to say uh, thank you to the public for accepting the fact that city council makes mistakes and we fully admit that, at least I admit that, and this is a give and take. So I think I've said before that in a healthy democracy or this is a republic, um, there has to be a tension between the people in the community and the people on the city council. And that, I think, ensures a good dialogue. Um, I support the uh, turn restrictions off of uh, Portola. I support the speed tables. Um, I think that's what you meant, Stephanie. At the cross rocks, I think um, I just was at the mobile home park there. They cannot cross the streets there. Uh, that, that is a major issue that uh, we've overlooked too long. And also on, uh, was it 42nd, right? So that's a major one. I'm still trying to understand the second sign that was proposed. Um, if someone could address that. Uh, the, what do you mean the second sign? There was another left turn sign, and I was, there was trying a, to get the meaning of that one. The, there's, there's one. One at uh, Portola and 47th. Yeah, for, that one I got, yeah. And the other one would be on 45th at Topaz. Okay, so that directly addresses Topaz. Okay, that's that's what I was trying to get to. So that, those are the four things I would support. Thank you. Kristen. Yeah, first I want to uh, say thank you to everyone who's participated, all of the um, residents. Thank you to Steve. It sounds like uh, everyone's really happy with the, the job you've done. It was fantastic. Um, I'm also really glad to see that there are um, the support for the options that have been presented is, is more robust. And it's, I think that when it first came to us, it seemed like there was 10% of support in every category, and it was hard to see what anyone would really um, support overall. And so I think this is a sign that, that we're moving forward and that we've come together as a community, and I'm, I'm really proud of the community in general for that. Um, I think that the speed tables are, are a good start, um, and the signs, as Stephanie mentioned, whichever signs would be most appropriate and, and beneficial. Um, I'm concerned about any of the moving forward with any of the mid or long term options right now. Um, I'm a little bit hesitant as we have done bigger, longer term options before and that didn't work out so well for us. So I think um, the signs and the speed tables are, are probably um, a, a good start. I think it's a good way to go. And you're talking about the neighborhood signs or the no left turn signs? Either one. Again, like if it's if the neighborhood signs, it seems like those are going to be most beneficial. I don't know. It seems as mentioned in the report and as mentioned by uh, some of the residents that they're they're not known to be in, incredibly helpful. Um, but yeah, it really any signage, whether whether it be the neighborhood sign or no left turn signs or whatever we determine would be most appropriate for this particular problem. But I think the speed tables are sp specifically something that we need to look at. Great. Hey. Yeah, before I get into the um, the, the item, I, I, I just want to make a general statement because there's something that's been happening the last couple meetings, um, and I don't know whether it's a reflection of our country, but um, it, it's what I've noticed in the last meeting. We had a meeting about uh, a, a home and uh, a neighbor making a request, and my concern is, is the way we talk to each other, the way we treat each other, and the statements we make. If you're going to take the time to come here and make a statement, it's recorded. If you're going to write us a letter, it's recorded. And there's a feeling that we had that in, in, the, in our previous issue, and I mentioned this at the last meeting, that if someone, there's a belief by some people that if someone doesn't live here because they have a second home here, that they're not entitled to weigh in and have an opinion. And in this meeting, I received a letter about um, on this project here that someone referred to it's amazing to me how a small group of dissidents on Topaz can get the city to do blah, blah, blah. And I was put off by that because, you, you know, the word dissident is someone who is rebelling against government, and that's not what this was. This was a group of residents voicing their opinions. And I'm here to tell you, after serving here for six years, I've got a box full of letters with people vo voicing their opinions, and I encourage everybody to have voiced their opinions. And then it's up to us to make a decision on that. But we don't need the name calling, and we don't need you know any references to who's eligible or ineligible to make a decision. And I will commend this group, because the, it started out pretty contentious in the beginning, and after the workshops, I think this group has been very polite 
So I want to commend you on that, but it, I'm just putting it out in general to the public on anybody on any issue. Please refrain, refrain from making it personal and try to stick to the task and make a good suggestion. Give us your input and let us make a decision. So with that, um, with regard to the Topaz project, you know, I, I came out pretty strong on this project. I wanted to do something, and I still believe that that you know our problem is is hugely motivated by Highway One, the congestion, and everything else. I don't know in my heart if there's a solution. I'm glad that there's some kind of consensus to try a couple of things. Um, you know, I, I want to be optimistic that they're going to work. I, I think that uh, the staff did a great job of doing some research. Uh, I think that when somebody says that you put in a speed table, it reduces the, the, the flow by 20%, I think that's positive, okay? I think if the Topaz residents went from 1,000 cars a day to 800 cars a day, they would probably think that's something good. So uh, I support the speed tables. Uh, the general signage, uh, the be nice signs, I mean, I would love to put, I think I would probably just put a bunch, of, I like the guy, I want those be nice signs. Just put those everywhere. But there was a different variety of signs that said this is a net residential neighborhood. Uh, I know the uh, Parking Traffic Commission may be lukewarm about that. Um, uh, personally, I don't have a feeling on that. So the motion I'm going to make is that we uh, adopt staff recommendation to put in speed tables, friendly signage, and then also include, include the uh, mid, what's it called, midterm, mid, uh, yeah, midterm options. Midterm option, which included the two signs on Portola and, uh, and 45th and Jade. So that's the turn restriction movements. Turn Correct. restriction signs. Turn, turn restriction signs, the be, the be nice signs, and the speed tables, or Those three speed points. lumps, depending on how you look at it. Speed tables. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second that. Just, There's a second? Just Stephanie, just comment. You know, that might be a wonderful solution, but the only reason why I'm hesitant is we haven't done any sort of traffic studies, have we, of what, how is that going to affect the other streets? No, we haven't. I would I'd be much more comfortable if we had some kind of analysis, because if it's going to back up cars all the way back to 41st Avenue, people are going to be screaming about it. Now, they'll take, it'll take them a while to get used to it and do something else, but I just think we ought to have a little, a little bit of numbers about what that's going to do before we, before we decide to do it. Jacques, you had something? I just want to bring up something to sort of settle my stomach anyway. Um, yeah, I think this group, all of us, we're a community, like Stephanie said, um, I started feeling really good when people started saying at meetings, I heard what Topaz said, and I'm taking different routes. And I've walked around the neighborhood multiple times now, and many people have told me that. So to me, that says something. And I think the community should be very thankful that that is, no one asked for that, but people are doing it. Um, I was part of a traffic study in Golden Gate Park, San Francisco, and we had a sense of trying to make changes. There was no traffic study that I remember. The expert said it takes a while to figure out what the new patterns are. And someone did talk recently, uh, came up here, and said, you know, let's try it. You know, the traffic study costs us a lot. It really does. But Steve knows how to put things in place and take them out after we figure out it works or it doesn't work. Okay. And, you know, I kind of like to leave it up to him. He's the expert. So I really go for no traffic study. Leave it up to our expert to figure out. Thank you. Okay. And I will say, finally, thank you for the motion. Thank you for the second. Uh, traffic studies are barely educated guesses. You know, they can tell us what they think is going to happen. They don't know what's going to happen. Um, I believe that I agree with the, with the motion. It's rational. It's a good idea. And I am interested in those traffic tables, uh, the speed tables, for a different reason. I've been dying to get better uh, crossing yeah. across Jade for the people at the mobile home park, as well as the folks that live in the apartments on the other side, getting to the community center. That's a really dangerous. And we have a crosswalk at the community center, and the next crosswalk is at 41st. It's just too far. Um, with regard to cars backing up on cliff, um, all the way to 41st because of the no left turn, I welcome that. I really do. Because they're all headed to Aptos. They're just driving through our town. I mean, seriously, I go through the village every single day. And, I, and I'd say 95% of the cars that come over the Stockton Bridge make the right on Capitola Avenue, and we know where they're going. 
except for Molly. They're not going to Depot Hill. They're going to they're going to to hit Park Avenue and jam down Park Avenue to the freeway. So I will have a roll call can vote. I, can I just get clarification? I want to make sure I'm clear on the motion before you vote that we're doing the staff recommendation that's up on the screen to. Uh, develop plans for the installation of speed tables uh, on Jade and 42nd. Look at neighborhood signage, which is the, we refer to them as the drive, be nice signs. Right. And we're also going to develop plans for the left turn, no left turns during commute hours, no left turn on Portola and the no right turn on 45th. Correct. Thank you. Well, uh, question? Yes. The last time we tried to reroute traffic, there was a big issue about the Coastal Commission or somebody that these left turn signs aren't going to do that, are, you? are they? I don't think so, but we'll certainly look at that one when we come back. But I, I don't anticipate that having the same as the, uh, the barricades would have, yes. Roll call vote, please. Councilmember Harlan? No. Councilmember Bertrand? Yes. Councilmember Peterson? Yes. Councilmember Batorf? Aye. And Mayor Termini. Aye. It passes, passes four to one. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, you can all stay for the bluff discussion, but it could be a while, so let's take a minute. You may leave if you like. I won't take it personally. We don't know yet. That's <laughs> true. Yeah, we, I hope we did so. Unintended consequences could be Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Yeah. What do you have down there? I'll save my peanut Oh, I'll try that. I have a a, a Snickers or a all righty milk. You want the Snickers? Snickers. 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 Oh, I don't want pretzels. <laughs> I can't. Oh, here, we're going to get Twix and I'll take it. <laughs> I don't like the pretzels. There's nothing like being the pretzel. I didn't pretzel. see the pretzel. I thought it was a oh, peanut sorry. thing. Sorry. <laughs> You've never seen this before. We're trading for the pretzel. We're trading for these things. <laughs> The pretzel ones? Really? <laughs> the pretzels are the staff favorite? That, 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 that new pretzel thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Found somebody bought those and then it disappeared.
Let's reconvene. We will go to the uh, Capitola Bluff Group report. Steve. Quick uh, summary here. Um, this council had previously approved the closure of a section of the Grand Avenue due to bluff failure in that area, had uh, made a section of the uh, bluff uh, insecure and uh, needed closure to protect it. At that time, <clears throat> the council uh, directed Council Member Peterson to meet with residents up there and develop some maybe uh, plans to how to get that pathway open again and deal with other bluff erosion. So the, uh, the bluff group, as they've become known as, um, will be here presenting their report. Yes, they're famous now. Yes. Uh, Kristen, why don't you give us a lead in on this? Sure. Uh, so we started meeting about 18 months ago. It's been a while now um, to look into this. And um, I want to thank you, say thank you first to the people who have taken the time to come to these meetings and look at these options um, and really kind of go outside our comfort zone and, the, and our, our zone of knowledge of what we already knew about to learn about new things and new opportunities um, for the potential for opening this path and or um, preventing any further erosion um, in the future. So I just want to take a quick second to thank um, our members which was John Hart, Misha Burrich, Tom Parker, Tess Sylvan, Margarita Jimenez, Jim Castellanos. And we also had um, visits from Gary Griggs, Eric Zinn, uh, Steve. We had our former uh, staff member, Rich. Uh, City Manager Jamie came to one or two. And our uh, mayor was at one of our very first meetings. Um, just to just thank you to everyone who took the time to look at this. It's been a, a long and, and sometimes difficult journey to determine what would be best and if it's even feasible. And so I want to thank you for taking that time. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce John, who's going to um, give a presentation of what we have come up with over the last 18 months. Okay. Yeah, and by the way, I discovered we didn't get any cookies during any of our No, <laughs> no one brought us cookies. I guess I should have brought cookies. So it's only I Steve, dropped the ball. St uh, clearly, Steve meetings get uh, cookies. Okay. He came but didn't bring cookies. Ah. <laughs> okay. Um, so quickly, I'll go through some of this pretty quickly. because it's Would you get in. closer to the microphone for us, please? There, there, there we go. go. Perfect. Uh, I'll go through some of this pretty quickly because it's already been covered, but um, the idea of the presentation is broken up into four sections, a back, little bit on background, problem description, uh, necessary first steps, and then longer term solutions. So that's pretty much it. Um, if you look at the background, uh, since the early 80s, uh, basically uh, Grand Avenue was closed and it became a, a walking path. And that basically for the last, what, 30 for 35 years, uh, Depot Hill has sort of revolved around that particular coastal path. It's become a community center, walking to and from the city, et cetera. So it's pretty important from the, you know, from Depot Hill residents' point of view. And so, that's sort of for 30 plus years it's we've had it and then that changed rather dramatically in uh, January of uh, 2017 when about we had this cave-in which involved about half of the um, Hollister to Oakland part of the path and um, basically it was abrupt and pretty dramatic and so what happened was that about um, if you look about two months later, you guys, and I think rightfully so, so closed the Hollister to Oakland part of the path because there was a lot of concern that follow on cave-ins could basically take away the path. And that's in fact what the geologist said, there was a high risk of that happening and that it's kind of silly to leave a path open if you think it could cave in at any point. So it was closed and, and then um, basically as Kristen said, we formed this ad hoc committee to look at what are the alternatives to try to reopen it and go forward. The, um, the other thing is that it became obvious um, when we first started meeting and looking at the problem that yeah, we've closed one of four blocks involved in the coastal path, but it's guaranteed that if we do nothing probably in the next 5, 10, 15 years, maybe 20 years, depending on what, how the weather is, you know, the rest of the path is going to close. So 
we're looking at either really do we want to have a coastal path and do we want to pay for having a coastal path and then uh, or not and and that's sort of the decision that we felt like as a committee this ad hoc committee we were sort of beginning to look at you know how can we keep the pa can we keep the path open how much is it going to cost and, and etc um, first question we ask okay so why did this happen why did these why did this cave-in happen um, and uh, understanding that it became pretty clear we had to bring in geologists etc you have to have some understanding of how the bluffs put together and what are the forces on the bluff so I'll try to quickly go through that if you look at the bluff 85 foot bluff it's pretty simple it's divided into two sections what the upper third is soil and the bottom two-thirds is sandstone and below the sandstone beach there's I mean there's a beach at low tide sometimes sometimes there isn't a beach and then at high tide most of the time the waves hit the base of the uh, of the of the bluff and that's really important and we'll come back to that because that's really the the major problem with the uh, erosion issues and I'll come back to that um, if you look at erosion issues, though, the upper third is it's completely different, by the way. The upper third has a completely different set of erosion problems than the bottom two-thirds. The upper third is soil, and so it's just like any, uh, any sort of bluff that's made out of soil. If it, when it rains, you're going to get a slow wash away, etc. That is not particularly dangerous, okay? It's slow, and if that was the only issue, if that was the only issue we had on the bluff, then we could solve it pretty simply. We could put some netting up, we could put, uh, plant some vines, etc., and we could control that part of it. So that's not the major risk, okay? It's pretty easy to mitigate. The major risk is what's happening at the lower two-thirds of the, of the bluff. There, daily, almost daily, you, it gets hit by waves. And the waves gradually start to undercut the base. And so you get a little bit of undercut, and you get a little bit of cave-in. Then you get a little bit more undercut, and you get a little bit more cave-in. And eventually what happens is, typically in the winter, the soil part, the top third, gets weighed down with water. Okay, so now suddenly it's a lot heavier. <laughs> and so then, if you have a big undercut at the base, that's when the weight becomes too great and the whole face of the uh, uh, lower two-thirds falls away. Then either the top goes with it immediately or if it's got vines and, and, and planting, et cetera, on it, it may hold on for a little while, but eventually it's gonna go too. And that, this is the major uh, safety issue. I mean, imagine, re remember at nine o'clock in the morning in January on a clear day, we had this issue that's in the lower left-hand side you had the entire half block fall onto the beach. If anybody had been walking on that beach, they wouldn't be here today. If the top part of the path, where the part that is at the top, probably we probably lost about eight feet on the bottom, I'm estimating this, and probably about the same amount on the top. It turns out the top part just went to the walkway. However, if it had gone through the walkway, and anybody had been on it, we'd have had a catastrophe there as well. So this is the significant risk in the bluff. It's when the bottom two-thirds caves in, then you have, a, you have risk on the beach and you have risk uh, on the top. So one of the questions you want, we started asking was, how quickly does this happen? You know, does it happen in 15 years, 20 years? Does it happen in two years, etc.? Well, Misha helped us out with this because he's with his drone. He started taking pictures of here's the Hollister to Oakland block, and here's a picture of it in 2013. And if you look, I have the four, the three little arrows are showing areas of uh, undercut, and what you can see in the middle arrow there. You can see above it, there's a little, you can see how it, there's been a little bit of, the undercut is, the, the uh, material has fallen off of the bluff a little bit. And the same on the right one, it's, it's fallen off. And, and so if you look um, a couple of years, uh, two years later, what you notice is on the beach, 
there's a lot of stones and rocks and there's been a lot more of the undercut it's gone deeper and there's been a lot more that's fallen off if you go on to the next slide in September of 216 that's four months before the major cave-in you can tell there's been quite a bit of undercut and debris falling off so the undercuts now have gotten quite large in two spots. The first spot is on the left hand side of the uh, walk, I mean the, that block and the right hand side of the block. At that time a lot of us were looking at this assuming we thought actually the right hand side was going to be the area that could cave in first. It turned out as we now know that the left hand side was the side that fell. So the, the, the issue is so where we are today is we have essentially the left hand side interestingly enough the base no longer gets hit by the waves so the, the base of the on the left hand side the whole left hand side is protected for a while probably for five to ten years I, I don't know for sure but there's a lot of stones down there that's protecting the base the right hand side is continuing to erode back and this is why it was so probably such a good call to close the pathway there because that that's pretty deep the right hand side's pretty deep and when that fails it's likely going to take the pathway with it so that's that just sort of supports the decision it's not the popular decision no, nobody none of us liked the fact that that happened but it's, it's it was certainly the safe decision so how do we what's the solution requirements and objectives how do we solve this problem we first said well what are our objectives and we talked about a lot of different things and it suddenly sort of dawned on us that well wait a minute sort of a minimum threshold would be if we could make the bluff as reliable as a bluff that wasn't on the ocean okay we can't make it infinitely safe that no bluff of any, anywhere is that but if we could at least have it as safe as a bluff that wasn't on the ocean as stable as one that wasn't on the ocean we're probably gone a long ways towards having it safe enough I mean that was at least our conclusion I mean we could argue about that but that seemed reasonable that was a reasonable position and then so well, then what we began, and, and at the top and at the bottom, how do we do that at both places? And then determine, then we decided to determine how could we reopen the Hollister to Oakland part of the path? How could we quickly do that? Is it, was it even possible? And if so, how? And then what, what are the long-term solutions? What if there's any, you know, once we have a short-term solution, if we can get it reopened, what are some of the long-term solutions? And we we were looking we then we immediately as a group jumped into long-term solutions and we began talking about them and exploring them and that sort of thing but then what we began to realize was wait a minute independent of the long-term solution there's something you got to do right away you, if you're going to try to fix the bluff at all there's a there's one there's a first step that you've got to take and you got to do it pretty quick if you want to ever reopen the Oakland to Hollister section and that's basically let, you've got to fill in the undercuts I don't know if it's possible if the undercut in front of um, the right half side of, of the uh, Oakland to Hollister part is already too deep I don't know that it may be too deep but if it's not too deep if you if and if we don't get a, too much rain this winter we might have a chance next year to fill it in and if you fill in that base that what it does is it makes the cliff stable you could so you fill it in with concrete and you basically um, bolt it rock bolt it to the rest of the cliff now what you have is a cliff that's stable it's not going to be stable forever okay so you need to have a long-term solution but it's probably stable between five to ten years I can't tell you exactly nobody can tell you exactly what it's going to be but five to ten years it's probably stable and if it's taken quick enough now what you have is you have a you can go ahead move the path back to the property lines and reopen the Hollister to Oakland part okay so because now you have a stable base and if you if we think the top needs to be stabilized the top third needs to be stabilized you can put netting on it I mean there's some really easy ways to make keep dirt from from basically eroding away um, so that's no matter if if we want to pursue 
stabilizing the bluff and, and keeping the path. The first, this is the first step. And it's got to be done pretty quick. And our suggestion is, you know, this, our block is no different. The, the block that failed is no different than the other four blocks. I mean, there's erosion everywhere. So if, once you get the equipment down there and everything, you probably should fill in all the undercuts. And if you've done that, then you've pretty much slowed up the erosion issues on the pathway. And now you have the time to figure out the long-term solution. And the long-term solutions, there's sort of two groups. And, and all of them, both of them are significant. Okay, so they're not, there's no easy <laughs> minor thing that you can do. But one is, we should all understand it, is, is simply if you put a groin, just like we have at Capitola Beach, if you put a groin in front of Hollister, you know, just put it out there, what would happen is you would create a beach along the rest of the uh, Hollister to Oakland uh, block. And the, your, you, the waves would no longer hit the base of the cliff. And if the waves don't hit the base of the cliff, you don't have the erosion issue. And you've already filled it in, so it's stable. So you've solved that problem. So the other, the other thing is, it's interesting because if you put in two or three groins along there, you would have a beach all the way down. And suddenly Capitola Beach would be as long as you decide, as long as you, as big as you wanted to make it. And so it's an, that's something the public, you, you might have a really, I mean, it would be very favorable viewpoint from the public because you've suddenly created a beach that's four times as big. So the other, the other, so that's one solution. That's my favorite. However, it's not, it's, it, it's expensive and it, it, it's not easy to do, et cetera. As you know, I mean, you're having to redo your groin right now. So, but it's exactly the same technology and it's exactly the same concept. And it does have the benefit of help the public gets a big, something big out of it. The second solution is, is just like Pleasure Point, put in a shotcrete wall. I mean, and it, it'll work. And uh, it, it, that's, that's the second class of solution. And, and those are the only two long-term solutions that we were able to find. So, so, in summary, there's a first step that you need to take if you're going to, you either decide we're going to let the, you know, we're basically giving up on the, the walkway and uh, it's just going to, and we know that in a, over the next 20 years or so we're going to lose it and, and that's, that's the decision or we decide well, let's try to save it, and if we decide to save it, we've got to immediately do the, stabilize the base by filling in the undercuts. And then secondly, uh, if we do that, then we could reopen the, the Hollister to Oakland part of the, the uh, path, assuming we don't have that cave in before we stabilize it. And then finally, uh, it fi gives us the foundation to go out and figure out what we do long term. It gives us some time. It gives us five to ten years to figure out what our long-term solution is. So, thank you. Any questions, Council? Mm -hmm. Stephanie? Has anyone talked to the Coastal Commission about whether they would allow another groin to be placed? Because I understood that when we put ours in many years ago that that was like the last one that they were going to approve and that they don't allow them because it causes sand depletion for the next community, the next community is state parks, they're going to yell loud and clear, and I think that, that that's, that's a nice dream, but I don't think a groin is, is probably possible. It would be nice if you could get some of these things answered well, bef before this presentation, because then you'd know that you'd have some answers. If I can jump in on that really quick, if you don't mind. We, we considered that exact same thing. Um, as a ad hoc citizens committee, there were limitations to how far we can go in doing financial analysis and coastal commission and sand studies. There's only so much we could do as a, as a citizens committee, so we did consider that that would be a, a huge roadblock in getting the sand study done, um, if the sand would be prevented from getting down to New Brighton, and if the coastal commission would allow it. Um, that being said, we kind of decided as a group that despite the limitations, we were asked to come up with potential solutions and we wanted to provide all the potential solutions, even if there would be roadblocks to achieving them, um, because we didn't have the capacity or, um, yeah, we didn't have the capacity to go any further into the, into how to overcome such obstacles. Right. We well, did Gary, ask, Gary Griggs could have probably told you if he did. Yeah, we did ask we did. Gary Griggs that question <laughs> when he came. 
And his answer was, it was obviously not a studied answer, but his off-the-cuff answer was, well, you've already got a groin, so the sand is already a lot of what subsequent groins would be doing, you're already doing. So part, part of the problem, you've already, you've already, I mean, in other words, the first groin captures the sand, okay? And so putting in the second groin doesn't mean it doubles the amount of sand. The first one takes an awful lot of it. Anyway, he seemed to think that that was less of a problem. He thought the major problem was that the Coastal Commission might not like groins. Is you know, I mean, they might not find groins as favorable as, as the, you know, they were Well, that's what that. I was saying, because it mm -hmm. causes sand depletion in the next community, and they're, they're, I don't think the Coastal Commission approves of okay, that. Let, well, me, let me try and close the circle here. Okay. Um, it is my understanding that not only groins, but plugging sea caves, which is what this undercut is, and building um, shotcrete walls, any of those three options must be passed by the Coastal Commission before they proceed. Is that not correct? That's correct. <laughs> okay. So whether they like them or not, that's a path that has to be taken. No, that's true, but that, she's right. I mean, we decided, we, we, our, we felt like our job was to say, here's what the options are. Right. And now if we want to take the next step, that now we have to go to the Coastal Commission. Is that Absolutely. Right? Understood and well done. And I'd like to open this up to the public. And if anyone else would like to speak on this, step to, up. No more questions? No one else wants to speak, so I'll bring it back to the council. Someone decided to speak. <laughs> Come on, up, come on up for the microphone, and we'll, we'll hear everything you have to say. One small thing, small thing. You speak Bring the, the microphone. microphone. Bring the microphone. Yeah. Answer, Stephanie, is if you take a look at the coast, what happens is it goes down uh, past Capitol and Depot Hill, then it, the coast makes a, a right turn, mm -hmm. a right 90-degree turn. That is a groin. If we have another little groin in between, it's not going to rob any sand from uh, New Brighton. It's just not, because it's a groin that goes for miles. Uh, anyhow, that's all I had to say about Thank that. Thank you. I'm going to bring this back to the council, um, and we'll start with Stephanie again. Or, this is just re just receiving the report, by the way. Right. So you can just make well. comments. There's no There's no action to be taken tonight. Yeah. To be clear. So that's fine. I'm just I'm just really leery of trying to fight Mother Nature. You know, we've been we have we've had a couple of vulnerable problems here, but Depot Hill early for many many years ago, and now recently, and the other side of the cliff, and um, very expensive projects. And the city doesn't have the kind of money to support these projects. That's the only thing. If we had if we had the money, that would be really nice. Jacques. Can I, can I so, no, I the the public. Comment period is closed at this point. I understand, and we'll bring up some thing. I have some things to say about where the money comes from. We, there's always ways. Go ahead, Jacques. So, um, thanks for the report and thanks for the neighborhood participation. Um, I know this history goes way back to the jihad and efforts to solve it many years ago. Um, Steve, I have a question of you. Uh, we did have an expert that came here, and I just want to get a sense of. Um, what was your take on the stability of the path um, from that report? And then I have a follow-up question. The geologist report we had done after the failure was he predicted the portion that hasn't failed yet on the slides, the portion to the right of what had failed, would fail in the next one to five years. That section of the upper soil is already essentially to the edge of the pathway. So any failure in there will remove the pathway back to the property lines at that point. And um, so there will be no relocating it without taking private property. Okay. Yeah, because I remember um, the engineer said no recommendation, especially for equipment, you know, which we would need to even make a path. So it was so unstable that equipment, that extra weight would be problematic. Um, so some of my concerns are um, the amount of money to do any of this work, who's going to pay for it. Um, I look to the jihad to get involved. But even before we get to that, uh, the permits and working with the Coastal Commission to find out what's even possible, 
Um, these to me are the first things that need to be done before we can even go further and a commitment from the community to actually go in that direction. Those are my concerns. Kristen, do you have anything to say? Um, yeah, I 100% I, uh, agree, and, and the uh, committee is aware of those limitations as well. Um, again, these are things that we also considered and just felt that we needed to come forward with the potential solutions. And as Jacques mentioned, you know, those those things would need to be considered before any any other action was taken um, on any of these, if any at all. Um, one of the other things I just wanted to mention because it, it wasn't mentioned in our presentation, but it was discussed, was other people have asked, um, well, why don't you just move the just move the path back? Don't worry about anything else. Just move the path back to the property lines. We also discussed that, um, and we felt that even with the path moved back to property lines, there wasn't enough space on the other side of the fence for it to be safe. We couldn't bring the the machinery up to rebuild the path. Um, there was some question about, okay, if someone falls off or if the uh, bluff falls onto the beach and someone's down there, is the city liable? And for the most part, we found that, you know, if we have signs, enter at your own risk, those kind of things, that there wouldn't be liability, but we didn't feel comfortable saying, well, yeah, that might happen, but we're not liable, so let it happen. Um, so we, we essentially um, felt that these longer term options were what we wanted to bring forward as an opportunity for creating a safer bluff that we could move the path back, but right now it, it's not safe for us to do that. So I just wanted to address that because I know that that was a question people had been asking as well. Good. Yeah, Steve, one more quick question. <clears throat> what would it take for the city to file an application for an additional groin? I believe, I mean, I can tell you, we've, we've filed a recent application to rebuild our groin. We had to do a complete stand study. We just completed an abalone study. Um, it, would, it would take a set of plans. It would take those studies I've mentioned. Um, it would probably take an in-depth stand study more than the one we're doing because we're just rebuilding ours. We're saying it's not going to change from what it was prior to that. We'd have to redo that analysis for low groin. Um, I'm not sure I can put that a dollar amount on that or anything, but it would take a significant amount of studies and we'd have to have a plan developed, uh, a plan that would identify for the Coastal Commission. So you're probably talking at least easily $100,000 in plans and projects before we just to make an application. To submit the application. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll make a couple of comments because I was here, as was Stephanie, during the Geological Hazard Abatement District um, formation and the hearing on that and I think that um, we're probably past time to revitalize that particular group and look at the assessment that would be required because it would take an assessment and all the residents uh, up there in Depot Hill to make this happen. I think that the short-term plan of um, plugging the undercuts still will require a coastal permit and you know that's conservatively good for 18 months to two years. So the short-term plan is really not a short-term plan. Um, I don't know what the solution is. I know that if we if we sit around and talk about it for another two years, when we get to the decision point, we'll have another two years to wait. So maybe it's time to start activating certain mechanisms and look five years to the future. Because at this point, I don't think the path has much of a future, but I think that your homes do if we move now and I think that's what needs to happen I'm much more concerned about where you live than the backyard of front yard of where you live um, I think the path is doomed over the next 10 to 20 years of going away the entire length of Grand I hate to say it but by the time we get something built I don't know that any of that path will be stable um, I am always concerned about public works working in an area that a geologist has told us it's hazardous to work on and Again, 80 foot drop, we have to keep that in mind. The money can be put together. This can be done, but it has to be done now. The planning has to start now. So I would return back to the group and start doing some research on what it would take to get the Geological Hazard Abatement District activated and move forward, because that's the way this is going to happen. Without that organization behind it, the onesie twosie sea cave plugging and, and uh, shotcrete walls, that is a tough boulder to roll up the hill with the Coastal Commission over and over again. With regard to the sand, I've looked at the sand study for ours, and I've looked for at others, 
And no matter what you do, the position of the Coastal Commission is, no matter how you say the coast is shaped, any sand that you collect is sand that does not travel. So as far as they're concerned, you're taking sand from somewhere. Right or wrong, that's the way they look at it. We know the Coastal Commission is not exactly friendly towards uh, projects like this, but we just had a sea cave plugged a little ways up the coast um, off of Cliff Drive. So they will let this happen, but we have to start applying and, and putting some attention to it right now. Thank you, Steve. This is, this is probably one of the most effective, intelligent, and articulate committees I have ever seen formed in the city of Capitola, and I thank you all. I wish I could go to all the meetings, but I, I promised you I would, I would step back and let you take the reins. But thank you, Depot Hill neighbors. You're uh, unique in the community. Thank you. And we'll move on to our next item. Um, Santa Clara, Santa Cruz Community Roundtable for Jet Noise. Mr. Mayor, council members, so this is revisiting an issue that began in 2015. Uh, council members are well aware that in 2015, the FAA moved the flight path that historically went over Santa Cruz, over Capitola. Um, due to the concerns that were created by that move, the city of Capitola <laughs> was offered a seat and participated in what was called the Select Committee, um, who met over the course of, I want to say, a year, Council Member Botorf. And Councilmember Botroff represent, represented the city on that committee, attended numerous meetings over the hill in San Jose, Palo Alto, Cupertino. And ultimately that committee made a recommendation to move the planes back from the current route over the new route over Capitola to the old route, the uh, Big Sur route as it was known. The committee also made nine recommendations to mitigate uh, the impacts of jet noise on our community. Uh, at this time, it's not exactly clear what the FAA intends to do with the flight class moving forward. Uh, remember that the select committee was not, didn't hold any authority over the FAA. It was simply a community advisory group comprised of locally elected officials. So where we stand today is over the hill in Santa Clara County, the Santa Clara County's Association has uh, been asked by local congressmen and women to form what they're calling the Santa Clara Santa Cruz Roundtable, Jet Noise Roundtable. And it's modeled after the SFO Roundtable, where the cities in San Francisco and San Mateo counties participate and provide feedback and advice for SFO as they consider uh, issues related to airport noise and activity. Um, really, I think it's intended to be a sort of a Santa Clara, Santa Cruz County's forum to talk about SFO or San Jose uh, airport jet noise. Um, obviously, the jet noise issue is very important to some members of our community. However, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't point out the fact that the SFO roundtable, despite having been in existence for 30 plus years, has had relatively few wins with the FAA in terms of actually effectuating changes in policy. Uh, the proposed membership, at this point, the fees aren't exactly set. The budget is set for the uh, round table, but it's contingent upon how many cities end up joining. Right now, we're looking at a fee structure would be around two to $3,000 a year. Um, we would need a representative to attend the meetings, which would likely be held over the hill. They are discussing the potential, at least, of having uh, remote meeting opportunities. Um, we do have uh, available budget. I think we have $3,000 left in the city manager on anticipated events um, fund for the $3,000 it would require. So with that, oh, in addition, the county considered this recently and did elect to adjoin the round table uh, with a number of conditions. And one of them was that they were gonna evaluate the effectiveness of the committee after one year of membership. So that would be my recommendation if we do elect to join the committee that we would uh, do so and reevaluate the effect effectiveness um, come next year and see whether or not it, it's proving to be a tool that's uh, making a difference for our community. With that, I'm available for questions. Any questions? Anyone from the public like to speak on this item? You know, at this stage, you can talk up to three minutes. I don't care what color your card is. <laughs> Hi, my name is John Galena. I want to thank Ed Botter for attending all those uh, select committee uh, meetings. And I would uh, ask that the uh, council uh, approve and go ahead with this. 
um, to continue the work that Ed has been doing. Uh, I mean, just fear that uh, this path is that got moved over us, uh, you know, a few years ago is just going to continue to grow because SFO is, you know, it's all about grow, 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 be more plans all the time. And uh, I know it may not be, uh, you know, the, the the effectiveness is uncertain or maybe low, but I, if we don't go, there's absolutely no uh, in, uh, influence over the FAA because they. I guess it's hard to get access to the FAA, and this you do have a little face-to-face -face talk with them, or meetings with them, and maybe there'll be some influence. And so I think it's a small price to pay for uh, a potential benefit. So I am please uh, vote for this. Thank you. Next. Hey, Brett. Um, so I think this is one of the number one issues we need to be involved. Ed has done a great job on the select committee. We need to continue to have a voice in front of the FAA. I mean, this, this keeps us up literally at night, and uh, so we need to continue to push on the FAA to make changes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Hi, I just want, I'm Kathleen Atchison. I think I know everybody, and I wanted to thank you for your continued participation in this. I, as John said, I know it's uncertain, but we really appreciate as a community your continuing involvement as it does keep us up at night, and uh, it's pretty, noise control, I think, is a pretty important part of our environment. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak? Susanna Atlina, uh, Depot Hill. I just want to mention that it's not just daytime. Um, any of us that spend time during, I mean, nighttime, during the day, you hear it as you walk the beach, as you go into our hills. You know, it's it's an issue that's going to just get worse. So, um, to mm -hmm. to be in the round table at least will give us a little bit of a voice within this, and uh, hopefully, gain have us gain a little bit of control with what occurs in the future. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? I'll close the public hearing and bring it back, and I'll go first this time, uncharacteristically. Um, this is not just forming the round table, but, you know, Little Capitola actually gets a vote and gets just as big a vote as Santa Cruz, as San Lorenzo Valley, as a supervisor, as a, you know, state senator. This is... City of San Jose, this is important. And while the, you know, the F and FAA is federal, so we know we're, again, going against Goliath, at least we have a place to do it. There is no one more qualified up here than Ed. He's put the time in. So like it or not, you are the most qualified one. So I would gas up your truck real soon. Um, I, and I don't know if anyone has anything else to say, but I'll entertain a motion because this is Truly a no-brainer. I'll, I'll second no it. I'll nominate Ed to be our representative on the roundtable. And, and to motioning also to form the roundtable and nominating Ed. We have yeah, a second. I, yeah, and with, on, and with my under discussion, um, I, w I thank you, Ed, for going to the Board of Supervisors meeting where this was discussed and they voted on it. And I'm very disappointed, though, that the board uh, did not appoint John Leopold as the representative. He's my supervisor. And I'm going to write them a letter about that because the bylaws do say city and county representatives shall be elected officials from the cities and counties, period. So, you know, they just get away with some funny things down there at the county. In the future, keep your eyes on them. So you're being John Leopold is not on the round table? No. Uh, oh, the other, my other point is they're, they're going to appoint staff. And that's totally inappropriate. When you're there at a round table with your equals other elected officials, fighting it out or discussing it and so forth. You don't want to have put staff in that awkward position of having to fight. They don't like that. That's not their role. But that's what they decided to do, which is, I think, terrible. So we have a motion and a second. Any other comments? Just a quick comment. Yes. Yeah. I, first of all, I want to thank the support that was given from the people that came up. appreciate that. And, and John, I think you coined it. I wouldn't have said anything different. Everything you said was a little bit vague. Uh, I, I want to get, I mean, vague as far as what, what we're able to do and not do, but the one thing I am, I'm a, the main reason I want to get back on the committee and try to do something is is that 
you know, we did make a recommendation to the select committee to move the path back. And that agreement, you know, the main, my main reason for wanting to stay on this committee is to try to at least make sure the FAA honors that decision that was made by the county. And with regard to what Stephanie said, uh, the other thing I'm going to push for is it, it does say in the bylaws that it was supposed to be a county, a, a uh, elected official. And both Santa Clara County and Santa Cruz County are trying to put a um, staff. Uh, staff person on there. So when the committee gets together, I think that'll be one of the first things we discuss. So uh, I'm happy to do this for the two more years I have remained on the council. And at that point, uh, we should have a good idea about whether it's worth it to keep investing in that round table. So Before we take the vote, Jacques, you had a comment? Yeah. Um, thanks, Ed. I really do. And I've talked to a number of people who are quite frustrated with the um, progress or lack of progress. Um, so I see a lot of people here still wanting to keep going forward. So I think that's great. And if we're not at the table, we can't play. Thank you. I believe we also need an alternate. Am I correct? They, they, they do call, yeah, they do call for an alternate, but whether or not there's someone who wants to put their hands up at this time, is it's entirely up to council. I think we have Kristen, Councilmember oh. Peterson. I was That's working perfect. for Congressman Barr in 2015 when this started, Absolutely. and I worked on it for two and a half years, and I was really glad to not be working on it anymore, to be quite honest. <laughs> oh, there so you I'm go. So I'm really glad that you've stepped forward, but I will, I will no, be your alternate. No, that's a logical replacement. That's so we have our nomination. We have a motion, and uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Hey, keep the noise down. I'm sorry. I couldn't help it. We're going to go to the next item, which is the City Council pension discussion. Yes, our fat, lucrative pension. Oh, God. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the Council, this item is on your agenda at the request of Council Member Batorf. Uh, just as a quick overview, the City doesn't participate in Social Security, therefore we're required to offer, uh, by law, uh, some, some approved alternative uh, retirement plan to all employees, and that includes City Council members. Um, Historically, the city has offered purse to all its regular employees, uh, and in 1992, the city council adopted a resolution that allowed council members to also participate in PERS. Um, and what we do for our non-regular full-time employees or regular employees is we enroll in what's called PARS, which is an alternative, approved alternative retirement plan for our hourly employees. And so when council members currently join, they're given the choice of whether they're going to join PERS or PARS. Uh, that being said, once you've joined PERS, when you're first elected, you, if you've joined it, you don't have a choice, again, if you're elected in subsequent years, A, and B, depending on your status, if you previously worked for a PERS agency or maybe a PERS retiree, you may or may not ultimately actually have that choice. But right now, if you come in from the private sector and are first elected council, you are given the choice of either one of the two plans. Um, Question: You initially said that uh, you had the option of joining PERS. Can you can you just opt out entirely? That that's correct. You you can opt out uh, from PERS, but you you need to be in a plan. So the alternative to plan to being in CalPERS would be in PARS, and we'll go through with the cost and the structure of of those two and the differences between those two plans right now. So for council members, uh, based on the five hundred dollar a month salary, the the cost to the city is thirty three dollars and fifty cents a month for the normal cost for uh, council members' PERS, and that's paying for the benefit in the current year. Uh, they have the same, council members have the same cost sharing plan as other employees, that is you end up as council members paying 13% of the uh, PERS cost and the, the city pays the remainder. A PERS, for those of you who don't know, is a defined benefit plan, that is the amount you get out at the back end is guaranteed. Um, and what we're not talking about here is, is the unfunded liability payments. And that's when that normal cost that we pay each year for the benefit doesn't actually end up covering the cost because it is a defined benefit um, plan. And the reason we're not talking about what that UAL is, the unfunded liability payment for prior council benefits is that it's a sunk cost. Whether we opt out moving forward, if we decide we're not gonna have council members join CalPERS anymore, the UAL it doesn't change. It would remain the same. That is, in the UAL is the accrued unfunded liability, and we can't change it going forward by any decision we make today about future members and CalPERS. Um, and there's also there is an interesting. So the question is, is you know, I think we've talked about this before. Is is you know, should we anticipate whether or not the actual cost? 
normal cost that we pay each year for CalPERS is going to cover the benefit for council members in the future. And, you know, I see Council Member Term Mayor Termini smiling because in general the answer is no, we know it doesn't. The interesting thing, though, is, is that the, the question is actually, it's a very individual question, and, and for the average city employee, the answer is obviously it hasn't, but the council's demographics are different than the average employee. And so, really, the question comes down to is, is how old are you and how much are you going to be collecting in retirement and when are you going to retire? And so, in general, I think the demographic of the council has been actually, in general, retiring later than city employees. And so, as a result, you're paying into CalPERS when their actuarial assumption would assume you would have already been retired. Um, in addition, CalPERS always factors in an assumption of a 3% growth in salary every year. And you guys know you haven't gotten a 3% raise in a while. So whether or not council members are actually accruing a UAL is probably a pretty interesting esoteric debate and um, not something I can answer right here, right now. Very quickly, PARS. Uh, the city's cost for PARS membership is $6.50 a month. It's a 7.5% of salaries required to go into PARS. That's the minimum to have an approved alternative to Social Security. Uh, and right now our agreement with PARS is that it's 6.2% employee, which matches Social Security, and then 1.3% employer. So that's the $6.50. And it's a defined contribution plan, so there's no additional cost. It's just the money that goes into the PARS plan, becomes the employees upon separation or retirement, uh, and so there's no unfunded liabilities. Um, so with that, I'll talk a little bit about the options, is we certainly can continue with the existing retirement plans uh, and options for council members, uh, and keeping them consistent with existing employees. Uh, we could consider revising the contract with CalPERS uh, to make it so that Cal, you know, council members who are not currently members of PERS could not enroll in the future. Uh, it's a three to six month process, requires resolutions and documents be drawn up with Cal CalPERS, nothing they do is quick. Uh, but we could kick that process off. Uh, we could also adjust the contract with PARS. Right now we have a single contract with PARS that establishes that 6.2, 1.3% split. Um, that's a simpler process, but does still take some time, and we could adopt a second tier with our PARS plans and have council members have a different contribution into the PARS plan. So we, with that... we just pass a resolution that said that council members can only go into PARS, not into PERS? So it's not enforceable unless you go through the, that bullet number two. Ah, okay. Yeah, I mean, you could say we strongly encourage future council members to choose PARS, but technically our contract, you know, would make that option available to future council members. Jacques? So in terms of timing, um, this wouldn't cover people who would be elected in the next election. Uh, Whatever decision we make. Right. No, it wouldn't be possible, I don't think, to do it before they would be sworn into office. Uh, depending on the results of the election, though, I'm not sure whether or not any of the council members who are elected would actually have a choice, um, just because I think a lot of the candidates either have prior service on the city council oh. and have been either been enrolled in PERS or been enrolled in PERS somewhere else. So it's not clear to me whether or not, um, obviously depending on who wins, whether or not yeah. there would be actually a choice that comes up for anyone in December. So we could establish a direction right now to at least consider going to PARS. You certainly could. You could kick off that process and we could begin to research the, uh, you know, getting together the resolutions and the documentation necessary basically to make it so future council members, and it probably wouldn't be the, the class of 2018, it'd probably be effective class of 2020, but the future council members couldn't enroll in PERS. Good. I have a quick question. Yes. I think you already answered it, but I just wanted to clarify. So future council members, if they're already uh, in PERS through their employment somewhere, we can't prevent them from being PERS members once they join council, correct? Uh, so, so my understanding is, is that if we went through this process with CalPERS and we adopted the resolution and we took the six months to do it, the future council members wouldn't accrue any additional PERS benefit for their service. So. So what I said before about some council members not having a choice, mm -hmm. I think of council member Botroff, I think you might be able to shed some light on this. You're a PERS retiree, and when you came on board, my understanding is, is you, were, you were given only one choice. Is that correct? Correct. It was yeah. a conflict. It would, yeah. So depending on your status, you may or may not have a choice. But if we no longer have a contract with PERS that includes city council members, then the only choice for anyone would be PARS. Or to not or not take it because they have their own insurance. They have Social Security. No, we don't offer Social Security for council members, and we have to offer some. I mean, if they, if they are 
Maybe they're retired and collecting their Social Security. They have to get one or the other, Stephanie. Yeah. We're, we're, I, we're I, as an employer, by law, we have to offer a retirement plan because we don't offer Social Security. And, you know, I know you, you may have heard from some other cities, you know, Carmel is an example or Pismo Beach are ex examples of cities that, you know, I, the council members don't get retirement. And the answer is, well, they're actually social in Social Security. So that would be the other alternative is enroll the council in Social Security. Uh, it would actually be more expensive, though, than ours. And it would, I think it would cause considerable staff expense. To yeah, I'm sure it would take program. a bunch of time. Yeah, part Social is, Security is like, yeah. like a whole other class of payroll calculations. Anyone in the public like to speak on this? Seeing none, we'll bring it back. What's the pleasure, council? Ed. Hi. I brought this because I, you know, things that are going on right now, we, we've seen, we're looking forward to, to difficulties in our pension programs and expecting uh, financial problems with that down the road two, three years from now. We've gotten a situation where we've taken our employees on PERS and reduced them from tier one to tier two employees to try to catch up with the failing system. And it seems to me uh, we're trying to take care of our full-time employees, which city council members are not. We're, we're in that category of part-time and hourly. Uh, so it doesn't make sense to offer this retirement. Uh, I'm, what I'm trying to do with this motion is pretty much stop the bleeding that, that the council does to the budget. And the reason I do this is when you look at some of the numbers, you, the average uh, two-term council member on a PERS pension is drawing uh, $1,464 a year. Really? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> And when that person continues to draw on that for 20 years, he's drawn $30,000 a year after serving here, earning a salary of $500 a month. Now, if we were to be in a PARS program, uh, the city would contribute $576 over an eight-year term, as opposed to $3,216 over an eight-year term. Uh, the employee would be contributing to that program another $2,900, and it would be similar like a 401k is what, that, is what the PARS would be. But when you start adding these numbers up, and you start looking at the 3216 that you pay uh, to, to PERS for that person with the possibility, as the city manager mentioned, with the unfunded liability, exponentially we're talking these numbers are getting them at thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars that we're exposing. And I sit and look at us and we're trying trying to buy speed tables tonight, they're fifty thousand dollars, and I'm thinking it this is I think this is a measure where you're here, you're working as a public servant, you're drawing a salary. It's a part-time job. Uh, city employees have been asked to make cuts in their pensions. I, I, I think that this is something I'm not trying to go back after anybody's pension that has been here. Stephanie, this is not geared towards you or any previous people that have spent 32 years, but I'm thinking moving forward, I just think this is one of those responsible things that this council should do. And uh, the only thing that we should offer, the, 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 most, the, the suggestion that was made, was uh, the only thing that's available that we should look into is offering a part of retirement. Okay, so, speak again? yes, I don't disagree, Ed. Another surprise for you. Stephanie, <laughs> but, I, I always know you do the right thing. Well, I mean, that's the big issue these days is, is pension re reform, pension reform, pension reform. And I think it's fine for us as a goodwill gesture to throw in something to that and to make some change in that. So I know that, that I think that just feels like the right decision rather than keep the same system that we have. If we're going to be doing making some drastic cuts in a couple of years it'll feel better to us to know that we've thrown in something from from ourselves so i think i couldn't have said that any better thank you well i will entertain a motion but just a, a short uh, editorial i've been paying the employer and the employee portion of my pers since i entered so i do acknowledge that thank you now do you want to make a motion i'll make a motion that we uh, direct staff to use the number two bullet is that the one we needed to, to uh, revise the contract so future council members cannot enroll in pers and take that process and then we'll establish well we'll just investigate that and then bring it back and we'll we'll make a decision is there a second there is a second council member bertrand all in favor aye, aye. opposed and a unanimous decision there you go well see that we love it Thank you, folks. I, uh, anyone have any other comments? <sighs> I, I predicted no unanimous, but it happens. Thank you, Council. Good night, Capitola. And we may not have signs everywhere, but be nice to each other. Amen. Amen. God, that was great. Oh, boy.